Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain, literature, fairy tales, and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original stories, not just read the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Our goal is to at least break even to cover our expenses, so any support that you can offer to help us reach that goal helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Chapter 10, Paul Bunyan's Pets, Part 3 It was shortly after Elmer had recovered from his mishap that he one day came dragging into camp one of the strangest creatures that Paul had ever seen. This was a young, half-grown, and remarkably ugly, whirling wimpus, the only one of its kind that is known ever to have been captured alive. At first, it was of a very amiable disposition and became quite affectionate towards Paul. But as it grew a little older, it gradually began to manifest that inborn hatred towards mankind, which is perhaps the strongest characteristic of this species of animal. The wimpus is a creature of no mean proportions. It stands head and shoulders above the size of a tall man, has a gorilla-shaped head, a villainous black face, and a barrel body from which project long slender arms supporting enormous heavy hands. Its unique method of obtaining food when hungry accounts for the fear in which it is held by all who are familiar with its habits. It will station itself upon a trail or tote road, usually just around a bend in some well-traveled path, and there it will stand upon its diminutive and pivot-like hind legs, stretch out its long arms, and begin to whirl like a top. It gradually increases its whirling speed until at last the animal is whirling so fast that it has become invisible, making no more than a slight blur in the air. The motion produces a strange droning sound that seems to come from the trees overhead, and any creature approaching along the trail is totally unaware of the waiting danger. Where the wimpus stands and whirls, there the wimpus, there the wimpus stands and whirls, making his queer buzzing hunger call, until finally some unlucky person walks into his unseen presence. The beast's great hands outstretched and being thrown about with such mighty whirling force hits the newcomer with a mighty smack and demolishes him utterly with instantaneous ease. The poor man is deposited upon the huge paws of the wimpus in the form of a varnish or jelly, and the hungry animal can lick it off at his leisure. Paul's young wimpus did not at first show any dangerous traits, and for a time he was a great favorite among all the men in camp. Then, as he grew a little larger, he began to manifest an inclination toward whirling. It was but natural that he should, sooner or later, give way to his inborn tendencies in that direction, and though his master attempted to break him of the desire, the creature persisted in trying to make a top of himself. Soon he was whirling about camp with a rapidity which endangered the lives of the men, and Paul grew apprehensive as to the advisability of trying further to make a pet out of such a dangerous creature. Finally, the whirling wimpus gave way completely to the ferocious instincts of his kind and spun himself into invisibility right on the main street of the camp. There, sad to state, 
he jellied and devoured four of the workers who happened to come by within reach of his flailing paws. There's nothing to do but get rid of that animal at once, said Paul regretfully. But it certainly is a pity to see all of that tremendous power being lost in whirling. Well, Mr. Bunyan, broke in Johnny Inkslinger, the efficient and capable camp clerk. If I may offer a suggestion, we ahem, may be able to get rid of the whirling Wumpus and at the same time utilize him, creating for the camp something which it long has needed. He went on further to explain, in the greatest detail, the plan he had in mind, and so well did Paul like the idea that he started putting it to work at once. First of all, be it known, the Dakota camp was badly in need of a dependable water supply. The cooks could hardly get enough water for all their kitchen needs. Babe and the other animals of the camp found it difficult to get enough to drink, and in general the camp was suffering from the lack of a big central supply of water. It was with this pressing need that Johnny Inkslinger's suggestion had to do. Thanks for joining us today. Check us out on Patreon. The storytime level is only $3, and you can help us meet our small goal of breaking even and covering our expenses. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. If you can't afford to support us financially, go give us a good review, subscribe or follow, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. You can also send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.